So I know in the past we talked about doing some sort of SDK demo kind of a thing at KubeCon. Mm -hmm. uh, to be honest, given the workload or given what the activity I've seen, I'm inclined to think that that probably is not going to happen. Um, that, now that doesn't mean that we couldn't showcase some of the SDKs, for example, Scott, I know you, you guys have done a lot of great work on the Go SDK, so we could showcase that someplace in one of the presentations if we wanted to. Um, but in terms of some sort of global SDK interop thing like we once talked about, I'm not sure it's going to happen just from people's workloads, but I wanted to get your guys' take on it. Yeah, I think that's, that's probably right. I think we'll get there. Yeah, I just don't think it's going to happen this time. Yeah. Maybe uh, KubeCon E uh, NA. Yeah. Although I, I, my plan is to show the uh, writing a, a cloud event consumer producer using the Go SDK for the the intro. Yeah, and I think that that makes perfect sense. But it's not necessarily really about the SDK. It's more about like what it looks like to produce events. I'm assuming, though, you will highlight about how the SDK make, made their life easier. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, okay, cool. Like, I, I think the point about showing the SDK is that you, you try to decouple the idea of consuming the transport away from, and, and instead focus on the payload. Yep. Oh, speaking of payload, just tangential question for you. As I mentioned to you a while ago, I think someone I've I know was using it and they were getting base 64 or all the data was base 64 encoded as opposed to just raw JSON. Has that been fixed? That was, that was a bug in the K native SDK. Oh, okay. Never mind. Then. I don't think it, I don't think mine does that. Okay. Excellent. Cool. And, and K native now does use your, uh, the, uh, the go, the SDK from here, right? Yeah, we've been migrating for 05. So in 05, we, it'll it'll all be the this SDK. Excellent. And I actually found an interesting bug that I introduced, uh, adding headers and stuff. But uh, there's a new release now that fixes that. Cool. Oh, speaking of headers, we still uh, really need to figure out the uh, extra quotes thing. <laughs> Yeah, um, I just was looking at the agenda here. That's not on the agenda for today's call, but we should probably definitely talk about that. Because I know, Clemens, you had an opinion on that, but your opinion was to keep the quotes. Which yes, my opinion people. is to keep the quotes. <laughs> well, and that upsets some people. I think, I think we should also add uh, extra time zones. Just for Clemens. <laughs> Like a Tuesday time zone, we'll just shift it back by like 35. <laughs> Are you trying to make fun of me? Yes. I think he is. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just, I'm just, so the, the opinion is just that based on uh, us allowing uh, maps in um, uh, as types in. Um, in, uh, in, in, in attributes. And if we do so, then we need to be able to go and encode the full range of JSON in that field. And then, you know, a quoted string is a string. And right, right. I, so that's, I'm not arguing against that. I'm saying uh, for the known types that are core to the SDK, the things that are always going to be sent over the wire, I, I think they should be special cased because we understand their types. Uh, for things that are extensions and unknown, yes. Uh, see, but then, then, then now you're in treacherous territory when you have a unknown type that becomes, or an extension that becomes promoted into the spec, and all of a sudden that's incompatible because pr prior to that, it had to adhere to the JSON rule, and now it becomes to the elite circle of things that have a special encoded. Yeah, I was gonna suggest something slightly different, which is for, well, for a well-known set of types like string, URI, they just don't get quoted. But for other types, they, they can follow the JSON encoding, whatever you want to call it. Yeah, but now you get into the funny, you know, 
it gets it gets into weird. Then you kind of have weird edge cases where the customer is now choosing just to put numbers in there. And yeah, yeah. The trouble is that the the current spec on the wire for binary mode HTTP looks really strange. What do you mean? Like oh, it, just, it has a bunch of double quotes in it. It's, it looks really strange. Like to compose that, you have to do a bunch of weird stuff. So, so can I, let me just interject here just for a sec. I, I definitely want to have this discussion. However, let's make sure we cover any SDK topics first. Are there any? That's what I was going to ask. <laughs> is there anything related to SDK, since that is the point of this call that people want to talk about? Yeah, I don't, I don't have much. I don't have anything else. Okay, well, well, Mark. Maybe, hey, Clemens, do you want to make our SDKs talk to each other? <laughs> yes, I would. If you, if you just stick to the spec, it's all good. <laughs> Ooh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so hold on a sec here. That's the so, whole point of that document. <laughs> so, <laughs> but specs are allowed to have uh, typos and bad ideas. So hold that, on. Wait, that wait, is wait, correct, wait, but as soon wait, as, as, long wait, as wait, that's wait. there, so wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Okay, before we get back to this, Mark, you said something interesting there. You said you don't have much. Does that mean you don't have any? Did I say much? Yeah. No, I'm good, I'm good. Okay, okay. Hein, is there anything you'd like to bring up? Maybe Hein stepped away for a sec. Okay, well, let's go back to attributes. So, so regardless of, of the correctness of the quotes, I, I would like an official uh, from down, from on high, ruling because I can change the SDK to be compliant and that's no problem or I can leave it the way it's currently doing and it'll only talk with my SDK and people that didn't read the spec as well as the uh, uh, C sharp SDK did. So so Scott how I have a hard pro I have a really hard time like I've looked at this and I've thought about this for for a while and it's kind of hard to prove because I have nothing written out about it about the thinking but um, as it is, if you decide not to change anything. Um, I want to see the rule. Like, like, write down the rule, write down what you think works, because I, I don't find a, I don't find a future proof um, way to, to make this work and then still allow the type, the rest of the type system in those fields. But it so, works because of versioning. Like as things get promoted into versions, then they can. Yeah, but I want to have a, I want to have an expl I want to have a, a normative explanation of the exception that you want to formulate. Like I want to see it in writing. Well, so Clemens, I, I think I can come up with a rule, but I, I want to make sure I understand what you said earlier before I actually put out a proposal, which is when I said uh, we know how to serialize the types that we know about, right? Strings don't have quotes and stuff like that. You said there are some edge cases that, that cause concerns, in particular that someone can just put a number there. Explain to me why that's a problem. Because even if they put just a number, if we define it as a string, it gets read as a string. All the, so the, the reason for that is an extension, effective for all extensions, anything, anything that's data that's just being added as extensions defined, well known or, or unknown to the, the, to the envelope. Anything that's there, we basically rely on type inference, um, or we rely on uh, you know type information in the um, sorry for AMP for instance. We rely on the AMP type type system because that's there, right? And and there you say this is a string and this is a map and this is an int and blah blah. blah. So that has that. Um, for for HTTP. Since HTTP the header is a string, you rely then necessarily on type inference of the encoding where we've chosen to use, and that's JSON. And so, and so for to figure out that something is a string for a unknown attribute, you'll have to rely on you know a string being coded because otherwise you can't identify that as a string, or at least you can't tell it apart from a uh, a string that contains only numbers. Um, and uh, you, you probably don't, you don't necessarily know what to do with, with curly braces or with, with square brackets, et cetera. So you well, have to rely on, you have, in fact, you have to rely on, on, on it, uh, type inference. Well, if then the case happens, if then the case happens that a unknown type becomes promoted to a well-known extension, 
or becomes even uh, more so becomes a part of the core spec, then all of a sudden the encoding changes. But, but that's that little the, strange. Yeah, but, but Clemens though, when, when an extension gets defined or when an extension is used, there are two options in front of them, in front of people, right? The extension has been well-defined, so you know exactly what type it is. Yes. So there's no ambiguity there. Well, there is, because you can choose to completely ignore an extension. Well, no, no, well, but then well, that, that gets into the second case, though, which is even if it's defined, someone may not know about the specification, and therefore it's unknown, right. and what does someone do with it when they receive it, right? Yes. Now, in those particular cases, though, I would say that that almost falls into the category of is an implementation detail, meaning the receiver is going to decide how to take this particular uh, string, in essence, and decide how they're going to store it. It may look like a number, but they could choose to store it as a string and pass that on to their function or their code, that application, in whatever format they want. That doesn't well, necessarily impact well, our that specification. Does, that doesn't work because if two, uh, if two receivers that are trying to consume uh, binary HTTP encoding attempt to consume the same stream, they, they need to use the same rules. And so they do need type inference. I think, now that I think about it a little more, I think uh, the rule that could be future-proof is that for every, for everything that's in the core envelope, they don't need quotes because they have strict types defined by the specification. For every extension, and unknown or unknown, they use the quoted JSON mentality. Yeah, but now you've now you've bolted down the the extent of the core spec for eternity. Because you no, can't take, well, that's I've sorry, bolted down. You so everything so so if you if you use that rule, then an extension property, let's say the thing we've discussed with uh, uh, the the partition key, right? If that if that's something that becomes so important that we think it's part it needs to become part of the core envelope then it will be quoted as an extension. But then as soon as it marches into the core envelope, it will be no longer quoted, which means that all code that is using it will now have to be effectively rewritten, uh, adapted for it to be not encoded with quotes. I'd like to understand what you said earlier, though, Scott, when you said two different receivers are going to have to said something about my, 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 he said something about my proposal that wasn't going to work. Can you elaborate again or say it again? I was saying the, the two different yes. consumers need to understand type inference as things come in. But don't they, well, but don't they only need to understand how this particular attribute is going to be handed to them from their SDK? No, 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 no. Um, it's, it's independent of SDK. Okay, so let's say two SDKs are going to consume the same event and then invoke some function. The, the inner representation of that, the envelope, the context data, and the payload will be exactly the same, right? Oops, sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, but my point is anybody who's actually going to use that attribute has to know two different things. One is how the attribute is defined, right? It may look like a number, but it's actually a string, that kind of stuff. And that's part of the specification of that attribute. And they just have to know that by understanding it. Otherwise they can't really use that data for anything meaningful anyway. And two, they have to understand how the SDK is gonna hand it to them. And they may be handing something that is technically per the spec of the extension, a number, but the SDK may hand it to them as a string because, it, because the SDK doesn't know about it. So, I, I think the difference between uh, Clemens and I's perspective and Doug's perspective is that Clemens and I are thinking about middleware yes. and not the end consumer, and Doug is thinking about the end consumer. Right. So, so Doug, in that case, so I have, I have a case. I don't know what's making that noise. In my <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> there are some Microsoft stuff that I really want to kill. Um, so the... <laughs> Uh, um, here, the case I'm thinking about is event grid, where the incoming request is a, is a binary HTTP request, and then there is a, um, a route to a service bus queue, which then runs over APP. And for that, I need to be able to, to take the properties that were set and map them effectively into APP properties, which are appropriately typed, and then flow them over to the other side, where there may be 
they may be actually be on that route, there may be um, uh, message selector rules, which are uh, dependent on what that type is. So, so, I need, so I need type inference basically to, to keep the types right um, as they flow from HTTP into APP. I can't ignore that and simply say, well, you just deal with it as a string. But aren't most... Uh, I agree that it might be okay with that, sorry, for, for, for the core properties. But as soon as it gets into extensions, then the middleware will... Generally, the middleware will not know about extensions except that the ones that it cares about handling. And then, and so for that, we definitely need inference. And then for me, the question, that for me, then the compatibility question is, um, is one of um, when I go and promote something that is currently an extension into the core spec, how that, sh that changes everything. And so, and then that becomes, that becomes inconsistent. For me, that's just a bug source. Heinz, were you gonna say something? No, I just wondering that uh, on the selectors, aren't most messaging protocols, uh, Selectors are against the headers, and the headers are usually, and there might be exception, where they're always uh, string-based name-value pairs, so it'll always be a string, won't it? No. In, in JMS, they're typed, and they're, um, so JMS, JMS aware brokers uh, need to know the data types, and MQP is completely, has a full type system. JMS yeah. headers are all Java strings. They are, there is no typing in JMS headers. There's an implicit, they have, a, they have math functions, some, some brokers do. Oh, and yes, so, but, yeah. you're, but it's a string that's passed to you. Yeah, but then you're eff effectively inferring that from the function. But in MQP, in MQP so, so, I'm, so my perspective on this is effectively the MQP mapping of, of JMS. Um, in MQP, the underlying type system of, of MQP allows for, for properties to be typed. They can't, can't be complex types, but they can be any of the valid MPP types. Does, so just, does, just, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. No, go ahead, Hans. No, so they're just the primitive types, and that's it? Yeah. So you can, can be numbers, and you can even have dates, and you have constraints, but that's, that's permitted. The, what's constrained in MQP is that the, um, the property names need to be symbols, but the rest, the, the value space um, is uh, unconstrained. You can't have lists, you can't have maps. Um, but uh, they can be any any of the other types. So that that is that is type safe. Does the cloud event spec actually have to understand the types, or can the cloud uh, event spec treat everything as a string? We have we have um, uh, we have a few things that are not just strings, right? Well, we don't have very many. I know that we have we have an integer in. Yeah, the, we, What's it used for, though? We have uh, timestamp, which is basically a string. <laughs> yes, everything is just a string. Well, that's what I'm kind of wondering. I mean, do, can we punt on this? Because HTTP doesn't have this problem, right? Today, everything's basically a string to them without actually saying it's a string. It's just a bunch of characters. I'm wondering whether at the C, at the cloud event level, we actually need to worry about this, or we just say, nope, everything's a string, and if you understand the types, then fine, you can convert it, but that's outside the scope of the spec, because that's outside of cloud events processing. Yeah, I've done a lot of work to uh, take, like, for example, dates and turn them into strings, because Go will serialize out a uh, full date structure, if you're not careful. Yeah, we have strict, so what we started with, so what we started with in the type system is that the, the integer, the integer was the thing that started, that started throwing, um, uh, making it a little bit more complicated than, you, than it needed to be. Um, the goal was basically with the type system to distinguish between strings, um, and then, which was most of, most of what we had, and time, and time stamp as a special case of that, uh, because that is a string expression. It's just especially formatted string expression. So timestamp is effectively derived from string. Um, and then we only, we effectively had the, the, the binary as a special case because that might be expressed as a string, but then in the cases where you have the binary encodings, that is effectively bit by bit being put into the, the, the binary body. And then the rest of the constructs like the map is for complex types. And then any is either of the two. And I think with the integer, we broke it to jail and actually having to think about um, uh, uh, different encodings for these primitive types. 
Yeah, but if you, if you look at the current types that we define in our spec, not look at the extensions, but everything in our core spec is mm -hmm. basically a string. Yeah, that's, it, yes, it's it's a string or is it, it's a derivative of a string. It's a, right. Uh, that's right. So right. we could, we could, we could basically say, yep, uh, we're going to kill the integer again. Um, for, for, for the, um, for data, the fact that the reason why we have, why we have binary is really to just accommodate binary in data in the any type, like binary is not never used directly. Um, but just for attributes per se, which we're now debating, we're not talking about data, we're just talking about the attributes. Um, for those string and string derived types would be sufficient. And so we could go and punt, punt basically punt on that problem um, if we get rid of the uh, get rid of the integer. Yeah, this is the only use of integer that I could find, and that's in the sampling extension. Yes. Yeah, we, we we introduced it specifically in that case. Yeah. So it seems to me if we if we change the spec to be just everything's a string, period, we we don't have this problem anymore. Um, you could and you could subset string like timestamp and say it has to be in a particular format, but ultimately it is a string. Therefore, we don't have to do JSON encoding on it. Well, well so even, for, even for that one, for that, uh, that, that extension you were just showing, mm -hmm. it's still encoded as a string in a header. Yes. Are you saying, are you, saying you want quotes uh, around it? I'm saying uh, we, we say it's, it's encoded as a string that should be parsed as an integer. Yeah, that's fine. So, and but then, Yeah, then it, then it solves the problem. The issue that remains then, though, is that if you put a map into an attribute, um, then, and we have, I think we have a few pieces of extensions, or do we? Then, then, um, then the question is, can we, can we represent that um, uh, accurately? Like, can we encode that? Because the map is effectively, like we need, we would have to go distinguish between the string and the map. If we say, okay, maps are illegal for attributes, then that gets gets us out of out of that out of that as well. Well, what if we did this? <clears throat> what if we said if you're going to define an extension that is of a, a different type, and map is a good example, then you need to define the proper serialization for that particular attribute as long as it can be serialized as a string in the end. And if that means for this particular extension you want it to be serialized in JSON format, then that's the rule for that particular attribute. Yeah, and then everything has two representations. There's the structured way, and then there's the binary way. What do you mean by binary way? Oh, oh, oh! I see what you mean. Oh, binary. Um, um, it's something we can. Like, I'm not opposed to that. So I, I'm, I'm just, I just need, I, we just need clarity. I think. Yes. Of, of, and and if we if we limit the choices, that's fine. Right. So as it stands, I think we need type inference. Um, because we need to distinguish between principally between strings and integers and then maps. And if we say we're not allowing maps, but like if you want, if you need five fields in your extension, well, bring five fields, don't bring a map. Um, and then, so that's a thing, that's, a, that, that's a thing we could say. And then, um, we can strike the integer and say, well, if you need to have a number, um, make a rule, but ultimately the only way you can go and encode that is string. And then, then in that case, then it's easy because then everything is a string or is at least something that is encoded, encoded as a string and then interpreted in a certain way, like a timestamp, mm -hmm. and, and we're okay. Yeah, then, then I would can let the quotes go. I would much rather head down that path. I think it's a much easier model. Um, well, then, then let's then let's uh, let's go do that. Yeah, I have. Okay, so, so now I have to dash, dash over to the to the customer call, and I will um, hopefully be able to rejoin the call at some point. Okay, because I have so much to talk talk about with them. So okay, comes, you want me to try to to draft that proposal, sir? If you would, that would be fantastic. Okay, that sounds great. That sounds perfect. Thank you guys very much. Non SDK discussion, but very important discussion. That's yes, good. very important discussion. Okay, I'll so, uh, catch you guys later. Okay. okay. All right. So people Can't are trying problems, to. But I will try. Yep. Okay. Scott, you're still there. Heinz, you're still there. Eric, you there? Good morning. Good morning. All right. Doo -doo -doo. 
I should just mention I couldn't get off mute there when you asked me if I had any other issues. The only issue I had is that I did offer to uh, referee a discussion out in the parking lot if necessary. <laughs> I, are we going to get into a fist fight? Is that what this is about? Well, it sounded like it to me. <laughs> oh, I, thought, I thought it actually went really, really well. That was good. Uh, hey, I don't have uh, any spare tables, so uh, it wouldn't be a very fair fight. Uh, hold on. Doug. Hold on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I got distracted. Somebody's paying me. What? <laughs> Can you make a, uh, an action item for me to stop volunteering for things? Can do, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that may be one thing we can't write down. So. Uh. Good morning, Adam. Good morning. I assume you're in uh, the West Coast. Uh, was that towards me? Yeah, just, just making conversation. I assume you're on the West Coast, right? Adam sits about yeah, 10. I'm about 15 feet from Scott right now. Oh, in that case, I apologize. OK. <laughs> uh, Ginger, are you there? I am, Doug. Good morning. Good morning. Fabio, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Hello. John M. Is that John Mitchell? Oh, no microphone yet. We'll get back to him. Hey, Roberto. Hello. Yes, Roberto's here. Hello. Hmm. All right. Is that Vladimir? That's right. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Type. Is that John Mitchell on the phone? That is me. Good morning. Good morning. Are you also in the Zoom under John M? Yes. Okay. That's weird. You're coming to two different ways. Okay. Oh, it's because I dial in uh, for better connectivity via my phone. Ah, okay. That makes sense. Cool. Thank you. Yep. Uh, Christian, are you there? Hello. Hello. Tam, are you there? Good morning. Good morning. Javier. Javier, are you there? Hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Yeah, thanks. Good morning. This isn't your first time, right? I already have you on the attendee list? Yeah. Sorry. Or is this your first time? OK. Actually, I don't think I have you. Hold on a minute. What company are you with? Codit. Um, Codit, as in code it, like that? Oh, yeah, without the E. Oh, interesting. Got it. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Do me a favor. When you get a chance, um, let me paste a link to this in the chat. Can you just add your last name just so I have that proper attendance list? Yes, is <clears throat> excellent. Thank you. All right, Mr. Curtis, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello, and Mr. Mark, are you back? Hey, I'm back. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Javier. Okay. Yes, uh, I can spell it. It's H U A L B A. Like that. Exactly. Yes. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, Christoph, are you there? Yes, I am. Hello. 
Um, Jam, are you there? Yes, I'm. Okay, and Jude, are you there? Uh, yeah. Okay, Rachel. Yeah, I'm here. Hello. Tapini. Yeah, yeah, I'm here, too. <laughs> I like, yeah, 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 whatever, okay. Um, Varun. Hey, I'm here. Hello, and William? Yep, I'm here. Okay. I feel like I'm missing somebody. Hi, Justin? this is Matthias. Oh, Matthias, that's who it was, yes. Thank you. M-A-T-T-H, I just got it. And then Justin Johnson. Are you there? Justin, are you able to come off mute? Yeah. Okay, Justin, if you're trying to talk, it's really hard. I'll, I'll take that as you being there, but it's really bad connection. And Justin, this may, oh, we lost him. Oh, he's back. So Justin, I think this may be your first time in. If so, can you do me a favor and um, add your company affiliation if you want to have one into the agenda next to your name, just for the attendance tracker. I put a link to the document that I'm editing uh, into the chat if you can see that. All right, let me do one last look and then we'll get started. Uh, Kathy, are you there? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think I got everybody else. Oh, Doug, are you there? Doug Mallory? Oh, no, no microphone yet. <clears throat> Let's circle back around with him. Uh, hold on a sec. All right, let's go and get started. Three after the hour. Um, AIs, I don't think there's anything here. Um, actually, I should mention, uh, we had a discussion during the SDK call, which was right before this one, about the header value uh, issue that I believe Adam opened up a little while ago. Um, I think we had a really good discussion and Scott took the action to write up a proposal. So expect to see something there soon. We don't need to go in that now, but just to let you guys know we did, I think made some good progress there. So hopefully we'll see how that turns out. Um, community time. Okay, for newer members of the group, is, this is the time for you to bring up any topics that are not normally on the agenda. So do we have any issues or discussion points people would like to bring up from a community perspective? All right, moving forward then. Uh, SDK call, as I mentioned, we just had one 30 minutes ago. Um, there probably isn't anything worth mentioning there other than, um, I know in the past we talked about potentially having some sort of SDK interop type of thing go on at uh, KubeCon EU. Given everybody's workload and stuff, we don't actually see that happening. It's, things could change if people get some free time, but as of right now, we are not planning on doing a interop demo for the SDKs at Kubernetes. You basically just due to people's workload and stuff. Um, but I think that was the only thing noteworthy to mention from the previous call. Uh, Scott, can you think of anything else that I might be missing? Uh, no, not that so. No. Okay. I mean, there was that one fight that we had, and Clemens is gone. But you know, <laughs> other than that, it's fine. Yeah, we don't need to talk about the fight. Um, let's see. Okay, demo. So we do have a phone call after this one to continue our discussions on the demo uh, that we're going to be doing for KubeCon EU. Um, Doug, I see you have a microphone now. Do you want to bring us up to speed on where we are on that? Just to summarize for everybody. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, uh, well, I think uh, what we would trying to do with the, the call after this was to just um, figure out a, a good way where um, the demo could be extensible to accommodate multiple uh, CE participants. Um, so I think we're still focusing on um, a simple supply chain within an airport setting, which involves uh, a retail, multiple retailers, multiple carriers, and multiple suppliers and how um, they can all participate in replenishment of um, cups that are being used to um, fulfill drink orders to passengers. Yep. And um, I apologize as we've been having, <clears throat> as we've been having these phone calls, um, Doug has been doing a really good job of producing documents to sort of explain the, the current 
thought process and ideas we have. We probably should start sharing that with a broader community because I know this Google Doc right here doesn't have the very latest. So we'll take the action item after the call, after this one, to start making sure that the documents are in a place that everybody um, can actually see it, even if you can't join the phone calls. But I think Doug did summarize where we are. Uh, does anybody have any questions about the demo work? Okay, moving forward then. Um, I don't think anything happened relative to the planning, planning for the actual KubeCon sessions themselves, <clears throat> other have, than the demo sorry, work. Oh, sorry, sorry, go I'm ahead. I'm on mute, I didn't realize it. Um, I have one question. Would it, mm -hmm. what do we think of the idea of having a demo that we reuse so we don't have to reinvent the demo for every KubeCon? So if I remember correctly, I think we were actually kind of hoping to use this airport one to do that as we go forward, because I think Doug has talked about being able to extend it uh, in the future. And I, okay, that sounds I great. I think, yeah. I don't, but I don't think anything formal has come from those discussions other than it has come up as part of that. But I, do, I think it is a good idea, though. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything planning-wise. I don't even think we've even really gone forward in terms of uh, uh, starting the presentations yet. The one thing I will mention is that uh, the CFP for the Serverless Practitioner Summit is tomorrow. And I did put a proposal for a very generic, you know, what is a serverless working group um, type of session for that. Um, and we'll we're going to talk about that uh, offline, I guess, or maybe we can talk about that if we have time in this call. Um, basically, it's just a very high level thing. We just need to figure out you know, if the text is okay. Um, but we can discuss that later. Um, nothing relative to KubeCon China. So I believe we're into the PR review. Let me just do one quick check here or something. Okay, no new votes have come in. Okay, so into the PR review stuff. Uh, so last week we started a vote on the min size type of PRs that are out there. And if, unless I'm mistaken, I believe this is the current status of the votes. Is there anybody on the call who thinks I may have entered their vote incorrectly? I believe we had Commerce Tools, PayPal, and Vlad voting for option one, and the other people who voted voted for option two. Does anybody think I got that incorrect? Okay. In that case, I think it's clear. I don't know the exact numbers, but the two definitely wins over one for that. So this is the one that we're going to go with. Um, I'll, I'll enter in the vote results into the PRs themselves. Um, but is it, before we move on though, um, I think the next steps here <clears throat> is for Clemens to potentially do some wording changes on this one. I think some people had some comments last time. But aside from that, are there any other discussion points people wanna bring up related to this? Okay, in that case, just Christoph, thank you very much for helping push this one forward. Um, I know that it didn't go the way you necessarily wanted, but I do appreciate you guys, you, you driving this so hard. And I know it's painful because it took so just, long. Uh, yeah. Sorry, can I butt in again? Yeah, um, please, just please. to um, make sure that like, if did anyone, does anyone, is anyone not able to do what they need to do if we go with option two? I, I still don't quite understand, to be honest. I, I, I think, we have concerns about end-to-end -end reliability. That, that's really what the drive of all this was about. So uh, I'm holding comment until I see what the next proposal is. Okay, I'm really sympathetic with that. And I honestly, um, sorry, I'm so and I shouldn't talk this much, but um, I think that we have op interoperability constraints in either one of these. And so like, just speaking for myself, I would have rather had more conversation. Um, and, and I'm really open if someone else wants to keep the conversation going about like how interoperators is supposed to work with either of these constraints. Okay, you, sorry for that. Sorry for just dropping that there. So <laughs> are, are you suggesting that we should have a separate statement in the spec around interoperability and then these become implementation patterns rather than yeah. the other way around? Um, okay, I guess for me, I was thinking that like, like I have, I, I can read the text, right? I, I can read the text and I understand what it means, but then it still seems like there are some unsolved, like there are some outstanding questions for me about 
how this solves, like, it seems like we have an interoperability problem either way because it's a should instead of a must, like we'll still have problems. And uh, like if middleware modifies things, like how do we, like how do we make sure that an event can get all the way through? That is like, maybe everyone else understands this and I'm the only one that doesn't understand it, but it's still undefined in my mind. So I'm trying to figure out the best way forward here then, Rachel, is this, I'm not I, sure. I don't I don't want to at all block like going with Clemens proposal. I just want to say like it seems like the start of a conversation instead of the end of it. Well, that's what I'm trying to figure out is because I, I, I'm not sure this phone call is the best place to necessarily have that conversation because I feel like we've kind of gone around in circles for a while. But if people do feel like we may have made the incorrect decision, then maybe we should have a separate discussion. I, I don't think it. I don't think that it's incorrect i feel like it's not complete like okay. like either one of these would have been like okay and this one seems easier to implement to me but there are a lot of outstanding questions and like there and we had we were starting to ask those questions at the end of the call like in chat there was like a very lively chat going on mm -hmm. and all of those questions are still outstanding in my mind so would you be willing to take the action item to set up a call with interested parties who would like to continue this discussion um, how about, okay, so I, in general, don't feel like I have a lot of time to like jump on a lot of calls, but maybe a doc that people can like chime in on as like, at, like at their leisure, would that be something oh. that people could work with? Does I'm okay with that, but do, do people want to continue this discussion in an offline fashion? Yeah, the, the problem for me here is that as far as I am concerned, last time it was me and Christoph in chat and how that conversation ended. Uh, as you said, these, these proposals end up with different constraints. Um, and I don't think there were any questions open between me and... Uh, Christoph, in that matter, it was just we are looking for the dif for different things. Okay, um, I might have different qu outstanding questions. How about as a action item, I uh, try. To, I, how about I write up either like a doc or I think it, I think a doc's a better idea than like uh, something in GitHub because it's like we probably don't want the artifact of this conversation um, to like live in the repo and try to describe the problems and like a potential solution as with the idea that it would only be a scarecrow, right? That I'm not attached to the solution. I just like, I want to be able to describe from end to end how the size, like how the size definition um, prevents interoperability and how we can solve that problem. Okay, so, uh, so normally I think once we have a vote on something, the decisions behind us, however, because I'm hearing that there may be some people on the call who feel like maybe we ended the discussions prematurely. Let's, let's sort of bend the rules a little here and say, okay, Rachel, go off and create that doc and let's see where that discussion leads and we won't necessarily rush through merging any PR oh, at this point in time. Sorry, I didn't mean to say don't merge it. I think you should totally merge it. I just think like <laughs> it, well, it opens up a lot of questions for me. Well, yeah, but I also, so let me, let me put it this way. And the reason I'm okay with not merging it is, and this is just my opinion, is that, you know, you guys can say I'm wrong and that's fine. Um, the reason I'm not, I'm inclined not to merge it yet is because I don't want people to necessarily code it up if we decide to go a different direction. And I don't get the sense that while it is a very important issue, I don't think it's necessarily a blocker for somebody to implement the spec to test out the rest of it. You know, it's not like we're going to change our encoding kind of a thing. It's going to radically change all SDKs kind of stuff. Yeah, for sure. And I, and I think um, it's a should. And so people can take or leave this one. It's, I guess, like the ultimate get out of jail free card here. It is, yes. So, I, okay, Jim, you have your hand up? Um, only to say that uh, maybe I misread the instructions. I thought we've, we weren't voting to merge the PR. We were voting on, a, uh, on the manner in which you might measure the size of a payload. Yes, so we are voting in that direction, right. yes. Yeah, so uh, I just got a bit nervous when we talked about merging PRs. No, 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 my you're point right, you're was, right. Yeah, no, I, I did say this earlier, I think Clemens had some work to do to, to tweak the PR a little, and now people can go review it for more stringent uh, wordsmithing kind of stuff. 
But my point was, let's say that's all done by next week. Um, I don't want to necessarily try to force a merge next week of a rewrite of that PR if Rachel's document has had some good discussions in there. Uh, that was my only point. Okay. I, didn't, I, I didn't want people to have an expectation that says, oh, Doug, we, we took a vote. Why aren't we just merging this thing? You know, kind of stuff. I want to, I want to be a little bit looser with the rules here because, you know, I don't think this is critical that has to get solved today kind of stuff. Is that okay with people? Yes. Okay. Okay. So Rachel put together the doc and I assume you'll send out a note or a Slack or something to let everybody know where the doc is to have the discussions. Yeah. Dropping in Slack seems great. Okay. Cool. Okay. Anything related to uh, these PRs people want to discuss? Okay. Um, next, Scott. Hopefully this is a fairly easy one. I apologize if you guys can hear someone blowing their nose behind me. <laughs> um, so this is okay. just a um, prettier dot IO's linter tool. It, it does a very opinionated version of markdown formatting. And I made no content changes except for in the, the I think the contributor.md file w was implemented in a way that uh, was not markdown compatible. So I had to reformat it a little bit. Hey, where was that? I can't. It's, it's, a, it's a different file. Oh. I mean, it's in the PR here. So I mean, yeah. it governments. Here it is. Oh, governance. Okay. Hold so on. this this section, if you scroll down a bit, I had to change the member format. Like this list with a, a numbered space dash space. That's not marked down. Got it. So strictly syntactical change. Yep, I just added a dot and then I bolded the, the member voting member admin. Okay. Now, um, Mark had a comment in there about maybe modifying the make file, but then you said something in response yeah, I, to him. I don't think we should do that um, because it, the changes like this are, uh, you don't know if it's done it right or not, so a human has to look at it. What other repo repositories do is they have a robot that will make a PR that you can go and review and check in or um, my 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 comment wasn't to uh, you know completely automate and check this in uh, in one fell swoop. What I wanted was just to document what was the command to prettify it so that if someone were to uh, review it, they'd we'd all be using the same command. Right. That that command is in this PR, and we could add that to the. Uh, some sort of document yeah. somewhere that says how you make a PR. Yeah, sure. Yeah, but we could definitely do that as a follow on PR to this, I assume. Okay. I love automation stuff like this. Anybody have any questions or concerns with this? No, thank you, Scott. Every time I make a change to the pros, I have to like do the like thing where you add bits of the file. So it seems great. So I, uh, I'll, I'll pimp my tool a little bit. <laughs> my personal GitHub, there's the repository called uh, Git Tools, and I made a command called, uh, so I extended Git so I can run a command. So I, you, I can do Git and it's lint, and it'll auto, based on file type, run linters for you. So it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Yep. Uh, just to be clear, you solved this at the git level instead well, of so I, I have a workflow that's like local to me but i use prettier and it does this uh command that you see here this is the the one that just runs everywhere but i, I used a version of this that only looks at your diff for your current com, uh, commit and it runs lint on that so i always check in stuff that's linted very cool yep all right any questions, comments, concerns on this one? Hopefully Scott didn't sneak in something. <laughs> I, I did not. There you go, thank you. I did remove Doug from the admin document. So. That's wonderful to me, thank you. <laughs> All right, any Doug, objections? Doug now has free time. Exactly. <laughs> All right, any objection to this one? All right, approved, thank you, Mr. Scott. 
Whoops. All right. Um, next one is mine. I don't think we've had really many comments on this one. Okay. So this one is mine. I just added some text to the primer. I think, yeah. Okay, this is the bulk of it right here. <clears throat> Basically, I just wanted to add some text to the primer explaining some of the either rationale or ideas behind the ID itself or the ID attribute itself. Um, basically pointing out the biggest thing here is that the ID is meant to be unique per uh, cloud event uh, within the scope of a producer. So that, for example, if a, a single occurrence generated two separate cloud events, those two cloud events get separate IDs. They do not share the same ID. Um, if you want to do some sort of correlation and stuff like that, look at some other attribute to do it. But that's not what ID is for. The ID is strictly meant for uniqueness across cloud events from a single provider. And as a result of that, <clears throat> what I did is down here, I replaced database commit ID with just a UUID because my concern was that Someone can interpret this as one commit ID may actually generate more than one cloud event. Therefore, it's okay to use that commit ID in more than one cloud event. And I didn't want to be able to, to make that mistake. And I don't want to get into that kind of prose in the spec itself. I'd rather leave that for up here, which is what I did. So that's why I just changed it to ID or UUID. And I'll leave that there for a second for you guys who may not have had a chance to read it. Doug, what about in the case of you, you are doing transaction IDs and you would like your uh, your middleware to provide you at least once delivery? Basically, this change prevents uh, using functionality that is at least once delivery mechanisms or uh, at most once delivery mechanisms because there's no way to know what if the event has been delivered to a destination or not. Can you elaborate on why you think it would block something like that? Because if you replay the transaction commit history for a database and you don't have a way to know what uh, what the cloud, ID, cloud event ID should be, you can no longer guarantee you've not delivered that event before. So this doesn't say you can't use a database commit ID as the ID. What it's saying is, if you have semantic rules that are trying to use this ID for some sort of correlation across cloud events, that would be inappropriate. But th th it's not preventing you from using the database ID if, if, it fits the, if it fits the rules of how we define this ID, meaning it's unique for all cloud events from this producer. But you, you can do replays with this, it, it's not, it doesn't block that because it's, it's replaying the exact same cloud event, so that would still be appropriate. Does that make sense? Yeah. Maybe I need to clarify that. We still have the trouble of if there are two producers that are reading from a, a non-cloud event supported uh, entity, they'll conflict if uh, the tuple is not there. Say that one more time, you have two. About unique, uh, so above you're talking about uniqueness, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I still think that you need event type in the uniqueness check. So, so I, the reason I don't think we need type as of right now is because the spec specifically says ID must be unique from a producer. From a producer, but if there are two producers producing events from the same source, right? You still don't know where that thing is coming from. You don't know if it's a replay or not. But if you have two, if you have two things generating cloud events from the same uh, source, then each of those two things are responsible to make sure that their IDs are unique, right? No, because their IDs are informed by that the entity they're reading from. So right. the things are re replaying database commit transaction, and they're using the ID from the commit in the cloud event ID. Right, but I think I think that's an implementation detail in the sense that if if whatever mechanism they choose to use to generate the cloud event ID needs to satisfy our requirements of it being unique. If they choose to use a field that's not gonna be unique because there's another guy 
doing the exact same thing from the, you know, and, and going to spit out something with the exact same source, then they need to do some, some coordination to, to figure out what's, what's going on and how to resolve that. Right. I think that coordination is vent type. But that, but, but then you're talking about changing the definition of what ID is. Right. No, I, that particular source is always using the same ID, but sorry, the, that producer, because it's contained. It just happens that another producer is also using that same uh, pool of data to pull I IDs from. So let, let, let Christoph join in. He, he raised his hand for a sec. Yeah, <clears throat> I think I, we tried to discuss the issue before. So that um, it is uh, if the source is not really guaranteed to be unique, you can clash on the source. So for example, I have the same uh, user handle on Twitter and on GitHub. So if both go and say there is a slash user slash Christoph, um, they may publish uh, sort of events for the same source. And if you only look at the ID and you're really unlucky, then they could also clash. <clears throat> so because they like Twitter and GitHub do not know how the other generates their ID, but they would be different in event type because one would be come Twitter something and the other would be come GitHub something. So in, in that scenario, looking at the type uh, would then allow you to understand these are different events. But the, the other way to go is, is to say, okay, the source should also uh, contain the URI and then you also don't run into this problem. So then we would explicitly have to make sure that people try to make the source uh, unique. Okay, so maybe I need to clarify something here. My purpose behind this PR was not to change the semantics of ID. It was to clarify what is currently in the spec. And I believe what's in here is accurate within what we currently have ID defined as in the spec, meaning we define ID to be unique for all cloud events from a single producer. If we want to change the definition of ID so that it's not unique and that the uniqueness spans multiple attributes, for example, type, then I think a different PR should address that. My PR is just trying to provide clarity for what is currently defined in the spec. Yeah, sorry, I may, blew, I may blow up the scope. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> And but I, but I think it goes back to what Scott's talking about because I, I Scott I'm not saying I think you're wrong in your concern, but I think what you're proposing to do is to change how we've currently defined ID, and I'm not saying whether I agree or disagree with that, but I think it's a different PR. Well, I read this as uh, trying to clarify the conversation that's happening in a different PR around how to understand uniqueness, or maybe that's this one. No, I think they are definitely related. Um, and this was just trying to provide clarity for what's currently there in the spec. And based upon that other PR, this entire text may go away or change. So if you want, we can hold off on this PR until that one's resolved, if that would make you feel better. I, I think they're linked and I think we should roll them into one or something because it's a, it's a bigger problem than I think we've been talking about. Okay, and I'm perfectly okay with that. I have no desire to, to rush this through. So in that case then, let me go back here for a sec. Um, but it's Alan's PR, I believe it's this one. In that case, then I think what we may need to do is to go back and look at Alan's PR because I think, I don't think he necessarily took it upon himself to change the definition of ID. He was more looking at it in terms of, given what's currently in the spec, how does someone establish uniqueness, right? And I think what you're suggesting is maybe we need to revisit the definition of ID. Do I have that right? No, I'm not saying that the definition of ID is invalid. I, I think a single producer that produces an ID should be unique for its own scope. But the trouble is you can't guarantee the scope of every every producer on a system. But that's what the I, okay, maybe I'm misunderstanding. My interpretation, doo -doo -doo -doo, let's get to the spec itself. So we're actually looking at it. Doo -doo -doo. <laughs> Where is, okay, so yeah, source and ID. Okay, so, um, 
Okay, so ID talks about it must be unique within the scope of the producer, right? And that, and while we don't actually, I'm not sure we actually come around and say this, but I think most people are assuming producer equates to source, which is why Alan's PR talks about linking these two for uniqueness. Um, oh, I guess it does right here, describe the event producer. Now this document, this in right here, doesn't actually say that source has to be unique across the entire world. Maybe that's something along something like that is missing from here. Or maybe, I, so I guess this bubbles up to the, um, sorry, totally clear. Uh, I work on Knative. I write uh, source adapters. I take things that are not cloud event native and I, I bring them to a Kubernetes cluster. We've been using ID, source, and uh, event type to understand the, the adapter that's read from a ultimate source, the source of truth, and then converted it into a, a cloud event in some scheme. We're making the choice to add uh, Knative to the event type so that we understand which, uh, which exact producer produced this version of the cloud event. And, and therefore, if we look at all three fields, we can understand if there's multiple producers reading from, say, Twitter, and let's say you have a, for whatever reason, it, uh, URL encodes everything, and another one uh, uppercases all the events, it's modified, right? Uh, but they still have the same ID, and they still have the same source. So does Clemens subject PR playing this as well? It seems like it has to. If Clemens subject PR comes in, it'd be a four pole. <laughs> I, as a result of that, I'm kind of wondering whether we need to take this offline and have a discussion about ID, source, subject, and type. Because it, I, it seems to me that we would probably make a mistake if we tried to modify or, or tweak the definition of just one of these without talking about all four in, in combination to see what we really want for the end game. I agree. Okay. Does anybody disagree with that? Because my next suggestion is going to be that we take it offline and set up a separate document or phone call or something to, to have some additional discussion so we don't kill off the entire hour with this. Does anybody disagree with that direction or are we misreading the tea leaves here? Okay, let's do that then. Because it is a very good discussion and I don't want to do a partial job. Um, okay. Okay, I will take that one offline. All right, um, next one is might as well. Okay, this one, I'm trying to remember, hold on, let me avoid your comment for a second, Scott. Okay, I'm trying to remember why I wrote this. Um, you are leading the witness. <laughs> I'm trying to remember what the heck I wrote. It was a big one too. Tell you what, I don't want to waste your guys' time. Let's take this one off. Let's save this for next time because I need to refresh my memory and, and page everything back in. It, it needs all. to get grouped into that doc that you have an action item for. Oh, we see the, the part of the previous discussion as well. That's right. Okay, wow, that makes it even easier then for me. Okay, cool. Oh, Clemens, you just joined the call. Excellent timing. Clemens, would you like to talk about your subject one? I honestly cannot remember if you introduced this in a previous call or not. I introduced this a while ago, but um, then we, we still had, we, we ended up we ended up introducing source in that discussion. Um, oh, yeah, you're going way far back. Yeah, yeah, of course I do. Because I also link that. I link. I think I linked that old the old issue uh, into this. So, um, in addition to what's written here, um, there's some supporting material that I'm pointing to that you might want to read. There's, I would say, a little book <laughs> um, available on on that uh, subject. But we ha we have already seen this in uh, also in the demo discussion that we're having for. Um, for um, uh, 
the next com the coming up event in the EU is that uh, in the demo scenario, this suddenly there was an object field or subject field that appeared. So basically, the reason for the subject field um, is that in source, the source identifies where the data comes from, but the source itself may have some further substructure that you want to go and express in that event. Um, and source is typically a way for you to identify where an event comes from um, in, in a scenario where you have, you're subscribing to multiple different sources of events and they all land in a single function. Um, and then you want to further, further understand what is that, that in that source changed. So example, and that's the most popular one, is you're subscribing to events raised by a storage container, a directory. Um, and you want to know when new files show up. So we, this is the block created event we're, we're generally talking about. You then want to know exactly which file was created. Um, and you want to be able to generically filter on this, which means you want to probably put a suffix filter on that file name, um, which is uh, .jpg. And you don't want to do this by cracking the payload, but you really want to have this in, in metadata. So now, the way how we've solved that problem for ourselves at Microsoft is where we have it, we, we have two fields, um, but for cloud events is to go and put the source, to construct the source from the place where we subscribe, which we call the topic. And then we put the pound, the pound sign, the anchor uh, effectively um, at the end of that. And then we append the file name. Um, and then basically to go and do some reasonable filtering on just the file name with prefix suffix, we basically have to know that we can break apart that URI at the pound sign and then kind of come out with our two fields. And that is the left part being the container and the right part being the file name. But that seems to be, so that turns now out to be for, for several people who have been, who have been um, imp starting to implement cloud events or also middleware for cloud events. Then that duality where you need to have information about where does that event come from? Um, and then further information about what, as what aspect of that source has been has that event been raised about is something that um, is uh, is in fact interesting to people. So that's why I'm effectively reintroducing this, even though we've had been discussing this for about a year ago, I think, um, and then ended up having just one field. Um, I think we're now having starting to have some evidence that um, having source as the subscription scope, if you will, and then um, subject as the additional identifier for the sub object that the event is really about makes sense. All right. <clears throat> Thank you. Any questions on this one? This is a rather large change, so I'm hoping to get at least a little discussion going here. I like Scott, it. Scott was, Scott was saying, gimme, gimme, gimme. So um, <laughs> some, some, some support, some more words to that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, we're, so in Knative, we're trying to work on, um, well, for, on the eventing side, we're coming to the need of some sort of registry. And there, if, you, if you're going to ask uh, all of the consumers to send to a central place and then ask that central place, give me all events that match the following criteria. And you probably want to do something like, give me the, uh, the bucket that events are coming from and give me all of bucket events. But I want to only know for a very specific bucket at the moment, we have no way to do that because we don't control the, the, the format of what a source is. And we don't know that we can always split on a hashtag or a pound sign. So we need some something that means uh, the, the, the parent object and the, the, the subject, which this, this fulfills. So we've actually started working on implementing this uh, as an extension because we need it. Okay. Anybody else want to comment on this one? I also think this is quite, um, quite needed. For every single example I've now given for other PRs and features, I've had to somehow work around this issue. And I think that shows that, well, it's an issue. 
Okay. I, uh, sorry, I have, I have one more point. Um, if this comes in, does source change? Well, I was going to get to that in a minute because I think Clemens missed the previous conversation. Because uh -huh. I was going to say was if, if we actually like this PR, then we can't merge it today. We need to pull this into the previous conversation of how does this relate to ID and, and then, as you said, Scott, how does this impact source? And I think we need to take out all those together first before we go about merging this one. So uh, I, I don't think it changes source because source is, um, I can imagine that what sort of discussions you might have had about uh, uniqueness of, 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 of uh, messages or of events, but source is really the place, the place that you, where you, for which you register interest, right, in the pop sub sense, that raise those events. And then subject is really a thing that is, that is relative to that source. That's, that's how I look at it. But source per se, I don't think source as a definition, um, how we look at it, it's the thing that raises the events. It's just that the source itself has some internal structure and you're interested in, in what, what is that inside of that source that just, that this event is about. And that's something that the source itself can't explain, really, because um, the source is, well, the thing that's raising the events. It's the outer container, if you will. Can but, you show comments and look at the comment that I made at the very bottom, I think? Yeah, I'll do that just, yeah, let me just point out comments. But if nothing else, wouldn't we need to do things like change the examples so we don't include pull request number one, two, three anymore in there? For, yeah, for and, and that's, I think that's a that that was that, there were some brilliant example brilliant uh, examples in the actually in here, um, in that um, the if you subscribe to pull requests, so you're interested in pull requests. Let, let's just look at the highlighted piece, right? What you will subscribe on is on the cloud events repositories pull request source, right? That's what that's where you will subscribe on. And and when you get events, that's how you will discriminate them from other events because you're going to look at this and say, so you're going to have your your pull request notification service. The first half is I want to know, I want to identify which repository they are associated with. That's the, the left side of this. That's the thing you subscribe to. That's that, exactly. So you can tell from this. Um, uh, which bucket they belong to. But the last part of that, the one, two, three, is not what you subscribe to, but that's effectively what this event, this event is specifically about one, two, three, that new thing that you didn't know about when you subscribed because it didn't exist yet, but that now comes into being. That's the subject of, that's this the subject of this event, which has a certain type, which has a certain ID, et cetera. But about that subject of the event, you can obviously raise two, three, four, five different types. So that's also why this is not the type and it's not the source. But yeah, we would have to go and change those. Okay, Scott, would you want me to scroll to? I think there's an example of that. Uh, mm -hmm. at the, maybe the last comment yeah, here. Yeah, that's exactly here. And the wonderful thing is the last, the last example uh, that Scott mentioned is the, the mail to with the subject help. That's exactly what that is, right? This is what, this is why the messaging system, including SNTP, um, uh, have a subject because in addition to the address where that stuff comes from, you still need to have some, some sorting criteria, how someone can go and figure out whether it's worth reading and often that's the subject. Should that well, I'm just wondering for SMTP, should that be subject or should that be something like a um, thread ID or something like that? It, well, how, so, so since SMTP lands effectively in your inbox as a thing that you look at, um, because that's for human consumption, the subject is exactly what you typically look at. And that's also how your threads are being sorted by. Um, I can have two threads with the same subject that get threaded separately because they were actually sent independently. And, you know, help is a great example. Um, if 10 people send help over the next two weeks, um, they may not be replying to each other. They may actually be asking, um, you know, for help on separate topics. I, I would argue that's a tangent of correlation. Um, but effectively, it, this, is, this is about how you tell... Um, it's a subdivision of, so the source here, 
which is the serverless working group mailing list is sending you events and because you subscribe to those. And now you want to be able to tell those apart. And the way that you tell those apart, if you look at it in your mail, in your mail uh, uh, application, is using the subject. And yes, there might be a further criterion with the thread ID, which then allows the client to go and, 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 figure, and figure that out. But that's, a, that's an ex additional correlation feature. I have a question. How does this, yeah. so I, I am concerned about making something like the PubSub channel or the Kafka topic or something like that, like baking that in, in a way that like, um, seems like not like people will be using not Kafka or not PubSub. And I want to make sure that this is like something that works for everybody. Uh, and, and it reminds me a lot of the conversation we had about topic, which was an attribute proposed, I don't know, like a year and a half ago or something. What is the different, like, how is this different than the conversation we had around topic? Um, I, I think, I think what, I think the thing that got in the topic discussion, um, the, the, what, what caused most confusion is that the topic is necessarily a thing that isn't middleware construct. Um, at least, at least in the way how it's usually perceived. And now I'm already knee deep into, into messaging philosophy. Um, the source. But, but I, I think that I think that like we're already into messaging philosophy is like the important point here, right? Like we are we're baking in like a messaging paradigm. So I'm, I'm, I think we're, we're, what we're doing here is we're, 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 um, we're baking in a, a, dispatch, a, a dispatch helper. When you just assume, forget, the, forget, who is, forget whether there's middleware in play, right? You're simply, you have a function and you are asking um, 10 parties to send you something. And they, they sent you something about, let's stick with the, they created files example, right? So you have 10 parties who all manage files and they tell you about it. So now they show up with cloud events. The first thing you will, will look at to figure out what to do with that event is you're going to look at source because you want to know who just sent you something. And then now the second thing is you want to know what is that file that was created and whether you're interested in that file that has been created. Now, so you now need to go and be able to apply a filter on some metadata um, of, of whether you are interested in that file. If that file, if that is about a JPEG, you might be interested. If that's about something else, you might not be interested. So you need to have a, have, have a string that carries that information. Um, and that is distinct from the, uh, the information about who sent you that, who sent you that data. That's the distinction I'm trying to draw here. So it's not necessarily something that's important for middleware, but it's important for, for someone who is, who wants to distinguish between who sent me this. That's the source, and what is this about? And that's the subject. Okay, I, like I understand the need for this, like for for having something that describes the, the content. And I would love for the content, for like the description of this attribute, to have more of what we've talked about in here, like to to make that dis, like that distinction clear. Do you think that it does? Well. It does to me. I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. How about I take an action item to leave some comments on this PR and say, like, like I am, like the, my main concern, and I know I sound like a broken record, is that I want this to not just work for like the example use cases that we are thinking of, but work for like more general use cases, and. I worry that we are baking in, you must be using PubSub or something like that for like in this one. So maybe I can go through and add comments or maybe just like propose an additional um, like paragraph at the end that says that it's not necessary, that you, it's, it doesn't correlate exactly to a PubSub channel. It doesn't have to, it can be used for other things. So would, one thing would that be also, okay? But one thing you can also look at that is potentially adding something to the primer, right? Because typically the spec is relatively short and when you start talking about prose, that's perfect material for primary. But, well, I, but I think it's about this attribute specifically, that like that this that subject is not meant to be used as a like only as a pub sub channel. Yeah, but that's yeah, that's not what yes. Okay. I I I understand like I'm too deep in this. Like this is my 
I'm, I'm probably 20 years too far into this whole pops up stuff thing that I don't see the thing that you're missing and I would like to see the thing that you're missing in writing. So that would be fantastic if you would do that. Okay. And, 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 and one, if you do me one favor, as you, as you think about this, there's in the, in the comments, um, basically in the, in the, in the PR itself, I've linked the old issue, uh, which is prior, uh, basically I, I, I created an issue back in the day, which was pop, uh, uh, subjects, I think topics and subject, subjects and, or, or just subject prior art. Um, and that's linked from this issue. And then if you scroll fur further down, kind of five pages down, it's the issue text. Um, I have a list of, uh, Doug, if you could, if you could. It's in the conversation tab. Yeah, if you go in conversation um, and go, go, for, go up, uh, I put that into the, right, into the, up, 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 into my original, in, oh, original. text. 112. No, no, above that, that link, that one, yes. Um, and then scroll down, there's a, there's a whole prior art section on where I've actually linked the various different kinds of um, products and definitions of, of, of subject. A little bit this, one of your, this is one of your shorter comments, I see. Yeah, it is. Sorry. Uh, this is basically just short, this is basically just a little bit further down because that's actually a table. There, there we go. So this is basically that subject field and how that subject field is looks in various different kinds of um, infrastructure. So that's kind of the summary of, of, of that. That's not something that we're introducing here, but that, that's something that is, is very common in the, in the infrastructures. So I have a, um, for me, that's, for me, it's, that, that field for me is basically a given. Um, as something that in my head must exist in a message. And I understand that if you come from a different, from a different angle that it might not have to. Um, so, so, but I, in my head, I have a hard time closing that gap. And if Rachel, if you would help me closing that gap with some additional text, that would be fantastic. Okay, I'll read through this and add comments. And I'll also read through this topic, subject, prior art. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, hold on, where are we? Anybody's hand up? I don't think so. Okay, <clears throat> I got a question for you, Clemens. I think the answer is no, but I want to double check. Are there any other constraints we need to put on this around uniqueness or anything like that? No, this can be this can be literally anything. This okay. is this, this is whatever the whatever the the source thinks is the right thing to say here is um, is fair game. Okay. Anybody have any questions, comments? Evan, you've been putting some stuff in the chat. Do you want to vocalize those or let those go? Oh, um, just that I was slightly concerned about um, saying that subject or that source um, was related to how the message was published specifically, because if we're ending up forwarding these messages, um, it seems like needing knowledge of what the original publisher was, um, doesn't have a good decoupling between producer and consumer. And so I'd rather have source be some indication of the source system. Um, now it may be that in Clemens system, the source system is the pub sub, you know, is his pub sub bus, but I'm not sure if that's universal. So um, I just wanted to clarify the difference between the first place it got published and the first and where the event originated. Yeah. And, and this is, that, that's the place where it goes into this. This is where the philosoph philosophical piece comes in. And that's actually where I think where we landed on source and where I'm actually ha where I'm happy with that being source. Um, because topic is something, because topic is an overloaded term. So let me back up one. The, the way how, the way how topic is being described as an abstract term, which means is this is the general, this is the channel, the logical channel for which I uh, deliver events and where I subscribe events um, is as an identifier um, is something that is, um, I, I think that's still true that that's a good concept. However, since topic is also used and, and largely mostly used as a concept that is, is a thing in a pop up infrastructure, um, then you get to the point of, okay, so the topic is where I send that message and then I pull that out of the message and now I do multi-hop routing 
And and now I'll put that onto a different topic, different topic. How much, how much, how much is that worth that I put the initial topic where I publish that thing onto into that event? And that's something where um, even in our team, um, in uh, in the event group team, uh, we're now actually explicitly into into the native schema adding source because we have now realized that the that using the topic because of that overloaded notion is probably not too smart. So so yeah, I'm so the the topic will not be useful, but source really designates who ultimately put that event out, and that so, is, is a channel. So looking at the description of source right now in the examples, um, a couple of things that I think, uh, based on the chat, may have caused some confusion, is um, it, the often this will include things like the process that produced the event and some unique identifiers. Um, and in our examples, we show specific like pull requests, for example, or a specific resource in an API. Um, if instead that we said this was a representation of the source system um, and that it shouldn't include unique identifiers and that those should go in subject, I think that um, the confusion would be substantially reduced in the spec. I agree with you. Okay. I, yeah, I, I can agree. Be, uh, yeah, because so what I what I've been doing since since this is something that I've been reintroducing, um, and we've been having long discussions about the the this prior, I wanted to make the the PR fairly scoped and not not edit the rest of the spec completely. Um, but I agree with you. Like so, with with if we introduce this, then that needs to go with some edits throughout the rest of the spec to basically make clear what the relationship between source and subject. Okay, so <clears throat> since we're running low on time, and since Clement, you missed the previous conversation because of your other phone call. Um, I will listen to the recording about that. Well, the key point is <clears throat> we, we've realized that we probably need to have a separate discussion that sort of combines uh, ID, source, subject, and type. Because based upon all the, all the various PRs and issues that are out there right now, it seems like we may be get converging on this idea of we need to modify some or all of those four different attributes in terms of definitions or, and, or in the case of subject, add it to the list. And when you add this one, it's going to affect the other. So I took the action item to create a separate discussion to sort of have that broader discussion to resolve those four attributes in combination so that we don't do one PR that's in conflict with another. We're going to do it all in one gigantic blob, basically. Yay! Yeah, so. Okay, so let me ask this, though, since we're almost out of time. Does anybody have a fundamental objection to even considering something like subject? No, I think we absolutely need something like subject. Okay. I cool. Thank you, Rachel. I have a fundamental objection to not considering subject. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tafini. I appreciate that. Uh, I just want to make sure that, that we head down this path and someone isn't, it, it doesn't want to raise their hand and say, wait, 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 you guys are going the wrong direction. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> With that, let's circle back to the ever popular attendee list. Just to make sure, uh, hi everybody. Um, Matt, are you still there? Yes, I am. All right, Victor, are you there? Victor, could we do Victor? What about David Lyle? Yes, I'm here. Uh, Baram? Baram, are you there? What about Klaus? Yeah, yes, I'm here, sorry. Okay, that was Barack. Yes, I'm here. This is Klaus. Okay. okay, and Victor. Okay, did I miss anybody? Yeah, I think you missed me. Oh, darn it. Okay. <laughs> anybody else? Okay, in that case, I believe we're done right at the top of the hour. Thank you guys very much. Um, if you'd like to hang on, for those of you who want to talk about what's going on at the uh, demo prep call that we have basically starting right now, you're free to join. Otherwise, everybody else will talk next week. Thank you guys very much. I have oh, okay. yeah, Rachel. Go ahead. Uh, everyone can go. I just want to say, like, there's 